Good morning, Covenant College. Um, before I introduce our first senior testimony speaker, um, I have a quick announcement. So this morning we experienced some technical difficulties with the campus network accounts. So as a result, the password on your account was reset and we are sorry for the inconvenience that this has caused you. Um, please watch for an email in your Covenant account with your temporary password and a link to React. Um, the new password set portal where you can reset it. So if you have any difficulty or would like assistance in setting this new password, please stop by Mills 110. Thanks. Um, so there should be snacks kind of floating around this morning. They might be under your chairs. I didn't put them out, so if they're not there, don't get mad at me. Um, so I am happy to introduce um, Nabil Ince to you this morning. He hails from Maryland. He is the program director of Eastlake Expression Engine. Yeah, which is a music education program that's centered around the gospel in the Eastlake community. He is so chill. Um, he has a concert, if you didn't see the video on your way in, in Sanderson 215 on April 24th. Um, it's free for Covenant students and $5 for outside people. Um, he is passionate about reaching the lost with Jesus' good news through his gift of music, and he has truly left his own legacy here at Covenant College. So let's give a warm Scots welcome to Nabil. What's up? How you guys doing? <laughs> good, good. That was that was kind of soft. There's a lot of people in here. Good morning. How y'all doing? Can y'all make this some noise? Please? Hey. Okay. So I am a college student, and so uh, I was kind of working on this up until the last minute. System got hacked, so I couldn't print my thing. So that's why I'm using this. Okay. I am an artist, I am a rapper, so I gotta get some shout outs. First and foremost, big shout Gracie, big shout Chase, big shout Abby who's about to speak. Thank you for the words that you've given, you beautiful people. I see some beautiful brown faces in here. So big shout to all the black people, all of my black cohort. I see you, you're beautiful, you have dignity, I love you. And third, Thank you to those who asked me to speak. I'm humbled that you would ask me to give thoughts. <laughs> and so as I began to think about what I wanted to speak about, I realized something. Senior testimonies are a trap. They're actually a trap. I can't summarize my experience and with one idea or one concept. A lot's happened in this semester alone. I can't speak on eight, you know? And so I just decided to make a little list of things that I've learned here at Covenant that I like to share um, and that I'm going to take into the world. We could spend hours talking about any one of these in a whole lifetime trying to learn them. And so none of these concepts are lessons that I've learned, the lessons that I am learning. I call them living lessons because they continue to grow in depth as I continue to grow. So that's what we're going to do. That's what I'm going to do at least, yeah. So the first one, two things can be true at the same time that seem like they shouldn't be true at the same time. We here at Covenant understand this kind of sort of, we talk about free will and God's sovereignty, right? Two things that seem like they shouldn't be true at the same time, but they are. And here's another example. Uh, these days, I don't know about you, but I have so many reasons to give God praise for what he's done, but yet so many reasons for my heart to be grieved. Two things can be true at the same time. So when people ask me, like, am I okay these days? I just say, yes, but no. <laughs> two things can be true at the same time. Number two, when it comes to blessings, gifts from God allow capacity to extend love to others in acts of service. The music professors instilled this within me. Every blessing that I have, every privilege that I have, literally all of it, it's a privilege given by God for the sole purpose of service, not indulgence. 
and selfish pursuits. And with the help of God, literally daily, I gotta fight myself because if not, I'm gonna live for indulgence and man-made comfort. That's not the way I ought to live. And so every good gift that comes from God opens up opportunities for no, more, more service. These next two are kind of like, duh, but I just feel like they're so deep. And so number three, time never stops. Duh, it keeps going. But I think that's really deep, because think about it, we're always in transition, and this is hard, because I feel like we're always looking for stability, and stability is not really gonna be found here on Earth. The next thing always awaits, the next homework assignment, the next bill, the next season of life. Life is nonstop transition. The world is in nonstop transition, inching closer and closer to the day Jesus returns, right? And so. I'm living in constant transition, time never stops. Number four, I'm not God, duh. <laughs> I'm a human being. But during my time here, I've been confronted that I think I'm God way too often in the sense that there's so many problems in the world, there's so much pain, there's real pain here in this room. And I just wanna fix it all, but that's not a job for a human being. That's a God job. And on top of that, I'm a part of the problem. So balancing the importance of working hard with the reality that God's the one running point continues to be a process of growth for me. Okay, those are the duh lessons that I've learned. Number five, the story of our youth, students, young people, the story of our youth is being written right now. Like I'm able to hop out of bed like it's nothing. I literally hop out of bed. It doesn't cause me pain. One day, Lord willing, I'm going to be an old man. <laughs> Every step is going to be a situation, right? <laughs> and so there's a huge blessing that comes with the season of youth. Just like any blessing, that means there's opportunities to be of service and to love on people. I could show love to another human being in the way <laughs> old people can't, just because my body is more physically able and my mind too, right? And so it just creates more opportunity to serve. And this won't always be my reality, and so I truly believe asking God for wisdom while we're still in our youth is important, not only for the here and now, but for the decades of life that are inevitable to come, 30s, 40s, 50s, however long. Okay, these next two, almost getting there, almost done. These next two are like shout outs to special groups of people. So number six, to the fellas in the room, what's up? This might seem like a weird concept, and maybe it might be a weird concept to girls too, I don't know, but to the guys, true, genuine, platonic friendships with people of the opposite sex might be some of the best kind of friendships there are. I truly believe there's a lot of wisdom to be gained from our sisters. <laughs> so if platonic friendships are not a reality in your life, I would heavily encourage it, key word being platonic. <laughs> And that doesn't mean that there's not room for romance. Two things can be true at the same time. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> just how I feel. And yes, yeah, so I understand like in the world, you know, you find highly sexual content and even here, the ring by spring culture we know so well. I just don't hear people talking about how dope and helpful platonic friendships can be. So there. Number seven, to the artists in the room that feel called to be an artist by God and seek to make a living off of your ideas. Here's a gem of wisdom that one of my mentors gave me. It is important to plan. Fall in love with the process of planning as much as you love the process of creating your art. Overnight success isn't a thing and even if it happens to you, you still gotta sustain it. And so get creative, you are creative. <laughs> Start with your big goal or dream and reverse engineer it. Setting little goals to reach till you reverse engineer it to where you are today. Every move has to be purposeful, leading towards a bigger goal that you're working towards if you seek to make a living off your art. Keep in mind, plans will change, but don't let the goal change unless God tells you that the goal needs to be changed. You will get better the more you do it. Imagine the possibilities of the art you can create and the people that you can gather around your art once you've got decades of engaging that process under your belt. <laughs> and here's a tip. If you ask God for help, he will help you make your plan. <laughs> so I ask him. Okay, 
two more. The reality of the oppression that I face as a black man here in America has never been more real than it is to me today. And imagine, I imagine, I'll be saying that phrase for the rest of my life. The oppression that awaits me as a black man as I enter the world is not lost on me. Dealing with the effects of racism is a living struggle that will continue to grow as I continue to grow. Learning how to deal with that reality and respond to it faithfully and properly is a living lesson of mine. And the last one, it's important for me, it's important for us to surround ourselves with people who are different than us. As I reflect on my time, there's two groups of people who've changed the way I view the world, kids, women, more specifically women of color, more specifically black women, big shout. It's not lost on me that these people have extremely different experiences than me, either because of ethnicity, gender, or both. And while I can acknowledge the reality of my struggle as a black man, two things can be true at the same time. I can experience very real and heartbreaking struggle and still have to deal with privilege that many other human beings don't have. Hearing the stories of pain from people who don't have the same experience as mine made me realize how privilege will make you blind. No wonder the rich man walked away from Jesus sad, and why it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. Saints, privilege has a way of tricking our mind, our, my mind into thinking that I can disengage from pain and run towards man-made comfort. The kids I work with at East Lake Expression Engine and women have helped me understand there are struggles that I can't relate to. There is real pain I've been turning a blind eye to. I have plenty of examples of my blind spots being revealed to me. And the more I'm exposed to different people's stories, the more I'm convinced. If we're not hanging out with, doing life with, and intentionally loving on people who are different than us, we will live life haphazardly in the dark with the inability to see human beings as human beings. As people of God, we need to surround ourselves and love on people who are clearly different than us. In closing, I don't really know what to say, except I need to be a better human being. We need to be better human beings. We're contributing to a problem, the problem that plagues the world, our country, our city, our life. We need to be better, and the reality that comes with living lessons is they're impossible for a human being to fully master. That goes for anything, not just how to treat a human, your skills, your craft, whatever it may be, growth is always open. And so this is why it truly amazes me that the same God who literally conceptualized a universe and brought it into the physical is willing to pour out wisdom and facilitate our growth as we move through different seasons of life. If we would just ask for his help, he will teach us, he will pour out his wisdom upon us that we may become better servants doing work that won't be here today and gone tomorrow, but that will have eternal significance. These are my living lessons, powered by God. Thank you. Um, so I'm here to introduce our next senior testimony, Abby Ogle. And I'm going to do so by um, busting some myths about her. So if you follow Abby on Instagram, a lot of you are confused about why she's made four massive art sips this semester. She's actually only made one. The others were just big things she did. And if you want to figure out which one is her real sip, come to Lucas Art Workshop Wednesday, 7 to 9. There'll be snacks. The mystery will be revealed. Some of you eat with Abby in the Great Hall and see her being really fun and witty, but you need to know that just because she's like that does not mean she's flirting with you. That's an important myth. <laughs> Some of you have class with Abby and are amazed by her ability to always be put together and know the requirements for assignment. But you should know the secret to her success is starting things more than 24 hours ahead and keeping the syllabus so you have all the answers right there. <laughs> Our neighbors and hallmates think that Abby and I, but she's a little bit louder, <laughs> get really loud and ridiculous after 10 p.m. 
but you should know that you just can't hear the thoughtful and wise things Abby says late at night as well through the vents. Um, and finally, if you don't know Abby, except from a distance, you might think that she's wise and she might be a good role model, but she's a little bit unapproachable. Um, and that's true, but I think you should also know that she does the best Marmot impression I've ever seen. So if you're ever nervous, ask her about that and then you'll be great friends. Abby is all this and much more, and I'm excited to hear her testimony. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Abby. I'm a 2D and 3D art major, so that means that I've spent a lot of time looking at and making art over the last four years. I've learned that everything you make will probably take three times as long as you think it will. That if you start embroidering with hair, you become that girl on campus, <laughs> which is really fun, so don't hold back. And that if you let them, other people's stories will change your life. I have spent the last few years engaging with the stories of others and thinking about memory, grief, and loss. It's been exhausting, but it's also been one of the most important conversations that I've ever entered into. So today I want to share with you this conversation that has so defined my time at Covenant, thanks primarily to Professor KB Joseph, Dr. Alyssa Whitebroat, and Dr. K Kelly Kavik. I believe that we as humans need to learn to listen to suffering to realize that lament is not a solitary act and that we should go out of our way to bear witness to the grief of others. Oh, that's the hair embroidery, sorry. Um, <laughs> I also believe that art really can make you more human, as best said by Dr. Whitebrook. From introduction to art history, to art, to race in American art and visual culture, I've experienced the grief and loss of countless people as expressed through artwork. Though these artists are not people with which I have any kind of relationship, their stories have changed me. Altering the way in which I listen to the sorrows of others and asking me to be a more faithful human and artist. This has been particularly impactful as I have experienced my own grief as well as the grief of others who are mourning around me. If I hadn't been pressing into these hard places, having hard conversations about artwork, or seeking out the stories of others, I would not have been able to thoughtfully engage with the grief that was present in my own life. Though I realize that I have not lived long enough to understand the deep fathoms of grief, I've borne witness to the immense pain that accompanies the loss of a child, of a mother, of a spouse. And it has racked me to my core as I cry out to a faithful God saying, this is not the way it should be. I've watched the exultant hope born alongside a child that doctors proclaimed medically impossible and marveled over the grace of the father as that child lived for five unbelievable months. Later, when that same grace became interwoven with sorrow, I found myself at a graveside on a windswept hill. I've witnessed betrayal beyond anything I ever could have imagined and the deep chasms it created as it tore through me and people around me that I loved. I've heard the crack when a loved one falls on their knees, the weight of this broken place too heavy to bear. Watching those whom you love be pulled apart by loss is something that changes you. It rises in your throat and constricts your lungs, aching relentlessly, leaving you feeling utterly impaired. And yet, there must be some sort of tangible response to this grief. I believe that it is of the utmost importance to take the sorrows of others and lament alongside them to listen and truly hear them, to cry out to a merciful father on their behalf. Some circumstances require lending only an ear, others writing a letter monthly, or even making artwork that tangibly documents. The way that I process my own grief and the grief of others had ma has manifested itself through my artistic practice in many ways, primarily by making obsessive artworks that typically take over 60 hours to complete. As I make this, these pieces, space for prayer, meditation, and worship is created. My desire to make artwork about grief has been greatly influenced by the installation artist Doris Salcedo, who has particularly changed the way in which I make and experience artwork and how I choose to approach grief and loss felt by those around me. There's something undeniably holy about the sorrows of others and letting their stories change you. I believe that art can play a part in this narrative, and that's powerful. 
Although Doris Salcedo is not a Christian, her work demonstrates the ways that artwork can allow us to commune with one another in grief. Salcedo's practice is, um, as an artist is firmly rooted in research. Many of her pieces begin with a story in which she listens to those who are suffering and makes artwork in return that speaks of their story. As a Christian, it's important to realize that you're called to look and listen. This doesn't mean that you listen until someone finishes their story and then move on, but that you take their loss upon yourself and enter alongside them in their lament. In her piece, A Flor del Pie, Doris Salcedo calls attention to the lament of injustice done to the body. The title is a Spanish idiomatic expression that means an overt display of emotions. Though the definition cannot be completely translated into English, the phrase links flowers and skin, suggesting a sensation that is so overwhelming that it is expressed physically through the coloring of the body's surface. The piece is comprised of chemically preserved rose petals lingering between life and death, so fragile that if touched, they will tear. Initially, the encounter with this piece is alarming. As a viewer turns the corner, they all of a sudden are overwhelmed by a sprawling pool of blood that seems to be all over the floor. But it becomes strangely delightful as the viewer realizes that each piece of that, uh, that fabric before them is made of rose petals. Each petal is carefully sutured together, creating a shroud that evokes faint skin, delicately brought back together and made whole. Salcedo's painstakingly beautiful piece pays homage to the life of a nurse who, during Colombia's protracted civil war, attended both sides. She was tortured to death and killed. As you see this piece, it becomes a beautiful, sorrowful piece that is um, simultaneously a monumental memorial and a delicate offering. Though it's not a traditional portrait, it asks you as the viewer to enter into a story that was not previously your own. It tells a story that you must slow down and listen to. It's beautiful. The petals become a body and you bear witness to the suffering experienced. So why do I share this with you? Because I think what Salcedo does is helpful. She hears the story of someone else, she validates them by taking their story upon herself, and she invites you to do the same. You as the viewer do not know the details of the life involved, and yet you are graciously invited to enter into alongside those who are mourning. And I think this is something we as Christians need to do. We need to come alongside our fellow humans and say, I'm hearing your cries of lament. I'm diffusing the weight by sharing in your grief, and I'm amplifying your heartache as I cry out to God. In his lecture, Can I Have a Witness, Dr. Capic suggested that a full lament is deadly. Jesus fully enters into lament with us for the world, and it kills him. Grief is heavy. It surrounds us, and if we try to swallow it without entering into lament with one another, it will kill us. If we bear in mind that we are surrounded by humble individuals who confront the unendurable every day of their lives and miraculously prevail, the way that we look at one another changes. This is not a contest to see who has suffered the most. We're not comparing stories or suggesting that one person's pain is more valid than another. It's all relative, but if we take the time to listen to the sorrows of others, we help keep each other sane. I myself have felt this. I have been astounded by the ways that in the midst of suffering, someone else has so graciously come alongside me. I'm so often leaf, <laughs> I'm so quick to forget Christ. When you choose to dwell on your own and other people's suffering, things grow unbearably heavy, insanely fast. Don't misunderstand me. This is not a call for you to absorb everyone's burdens, but to take time to thoughtfully engage with those around you, to learn to ask thoughtful questions and to listen. It's really important to realize that witnessing means both seeing the mess and also realizing God's faithfulness. As I've dug deeper into the idea of listening to the sorrows of others, I've been continually reminded of God's faithfulness. I mean, embodiment changes everything. Christ himself literally took on a body in order to feel the same pain that we feel. This makes the incarnation, his death, resurrection, and ascension so much more powerful. He's looking at us through human eyes. He inhabited a body because it was important to our experience. He chose to understand suffering not as God had known it before, but as his creation knew it. He ascended into heaven as a human, 
and continues to feel and understand our pain even now. This is powerfully depicted for me in the account of John 11 that tells us about the death of Lazarus. When Jesus approaches his beloved friends and hears the anguish, anguish in Mary and Martha's voices, even though he knows the end of the story, he knows that Lazarus will live again. He doesn't say, stop whining, it's fine. He says, he, he's angry. In fact, the scripture says deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. This is not the kind of language that describes someone who's a bit sad, but someone who is shaking with sobs, falling to their knees and crying out, this is not the way it should be. <laughs> I've done that. Not only does Jesus display anger towards death and share in the sadness of those around him, but he does something about it. This is amazing to me. The Lord who loves us, who created us, took on flesh to join his creation, and even though he knows all things will be made right, he mourns alongside us. I do not know what you are suffering under the weight of, or what your heart is breaking from, and in truth, I probably never will, but I hope that those around you will take the time to. Know that you serve a God who hears your cries and has felt your pain, and continues to look at you through human eyes. Realize that though someone may seem to have something all together, they have some, someone else crying out on their behalf. We need one another to carry each other's weight. Take notice of the ways that you can tangibly breathe life into the places where there is none. We cannot make all of the wrongs right, but we can listen to the cries of our fellow humans, come alongside one another, and cry out to our faithful Father on one another's behalf. Let's pray. Dear Father, it amazes me that you are someone who listens to our cries, that you hear us, and you choose um, to love us and hold us until we're finished crying and make all things new. You are good. Thank you for this gift that it is um, to love you and be loved by you. Amen. <laughs>